Okay, so this is uh, what we call concierge calls with a professor. And if you haven't noticed, I we have this little friend and we call him the professor. Me and Corey love him. And we love him. <laughs> and, and I kind of was redoing some stuff and I know it's in some of our Facebook groups as well. And that was what I, I created this for and then pulled that off of there because I thought he was just too cute not to have on here. Um, so he's going to be our new kind of face of the beginning of all of our group calls that we have just as a side note. Um, but our topic tonight is enrollment management and saving for college. And our, um, there he is again. And we talk about enrollment management in the how to pay for college without going broke class, right? Like that thing that you as clients all probably attended at some point in time. Um, but we just touched on it a little bit. And then as we've been working together throughout this process, we have been diving deeper into, and that's some of those calls that Corey has been on with me too, is understanding then the cost of college in a way that you see college as a business and that there's reasons why they give us money and there's reasons why we don't. And so really we just have to understand that game. And so we're going to dive, I'm going to explain in more depth what that means is that business side of college, um, because that does play into how we position ourselves per usual on the student positioning piece and all the other stuff that we do and honing in and getting money for school. But then that's one thing, right? We want to get free money, but then it's the, now how are we going to pay for school in a way that makes sense? Um, and so the funding strategies for college yet again I also briefly touch on it in our college planning class but now Lance is going to dive deeper into that and Corey and Lance are working together in this whole soiree of stuff and he's been doing this forever so I'll share with you his bio um, but we do have two different groups of people here tonight so I do have my class of 2024 clients and then we also opened this class up to the community so for clients right we know, um, I mean, you guys see these every month, but for those of you that don't, right, we do a session like this every month specifically geared towards primary topics um, that are happening for that student's graduation year. And so we could have questions coming from different different groups of people, essentially, at this point. That's why I said we'll do our best to answer questions throughout um, and monitoring the chat as well as those come in. Um, so what in the world is this thing called enrollment management? Really, you can read this, but the highlight reel that I like to, to kind of focus in on is that it's the well-planned strategies and tactics to shape the enrollment of an institution to meet whatever their goals are. And the colleges can have a variety of different goals depending on what they're trying to achieve. And it's been around since the 1980s. Like this, yet again, is not a new topic. It's just understanding that depth of how it runs across multiple offices within the world of the college. So admissions, financial aid, registration, student services. And we just don't realize just how fine-tuned this thing is until you start diving into understanding really what all of it means. So some of this too, you'll see improving yield, which is how many people are showing up during these different phases um, and in the application process, in the enrollment stages, as well as then in retention rates as you are a current student and wanting to be a continued student. And then you'll see the revenue piece, which this is, I mean, we've taught this for years and this is kind of their term of it is using um, improving the proportion of entering students capable of paying most or all of the unsubsidized tuition, so full pays. And I'm going to break out a chart here for you guys so that you can see it visually, just kind of understanding then where do different people go in terms of this enrollment management world um, according to these different schools. And if the they're trying to increase their demographic diversity, right? increase how many students they're looking at. There's a lot of different avenues where this stuff comes into play. And this is my visual for you. Um, you always hear me talk about, we wanna be in the top 
25% of the incoming freshman class when it comes to the colleges that we're looking at applying to, where we're talking about academic fit. So that's where you're going to see these numbers at the top is if we're in the top 10%, that's looking at honors colleges um, or honor, you know, you're an honors kid, you're at the very, very top. And then we've got the top 25%, top 50%, and then bottom quartile, essentially. And <clears throat> here you're going to see that this is the college's willingness to pay a student that um, is kind of average or below average, and then what they consider to be an exceptionally gifted student. And that's going to vary, right, as we always talk about based on GPA and test score with what that school's expectation is, right? So this goes back to understanding student positioning strategies and all of that other um, side of things. But then we're marrying this with, and what is the student's demonstrated need? So this is where they have a high family need um, and then no need. So it's you, you can pay that full freight. Right. So if we start to understand, like if we stick ourselves just at a at a spot on the graph, our goal is that we like to get to um, this corner over here that you see says full ride, <laughs> which we want to move in that direction. We want to move in that direction. Exactly. So the different corners here, you're going to see um, if I'm. If I have no need really, right, like I'm, I've got a high income family and I'm an exceptionally gifted student, this is where we're going to see some form of just like a discount, the feel good, make it, you know, welcome to the club sort of thing. Over here is full pay when we have a not strong academic student, according to the students or the profile of the incoming freshman class, and we have that ability to pay full price. That's kind of where we expect that we're probably going to have to pony up that full sticker cost in order to go. This is a really terrible corner that we call admit deny, which is where they let us in but they know that we can't afford it based on the you know expected family contribution and everything else that we've provided to them and so they either they gap us and they don't give us what we need in order to be able to attend or they don't give us anything but they let us in so that's where those schools wind up um 10 you know they're just out of budget typically for most families um, and then like, this is the happiest corner of all time, right? Where it's like the pot at the end of the rainbow, of course, because you're the shiniest student and you've managed to check all of those boxes for the school and they're giving you the most money that you can get. Okay. Really, that is like the best case scenario. And we really just want to be somewhere on that spectrum, like Corey said, heading in that corner where we are that strong academic student and they're going to give us the strongest discounts and opportunities that we can. So we always talk about it from the positioning, when we call it student positioning strategies and under, understanding enrollment management, step one in terms of this process is always managing to look at the school so that we understand where we're getting those discounts from, right? And as, as most of you know, and my clients know, that that is my J-O-B, right? Like I am working with you and I will tell you when we get to that point, we're going to start looking at what is that anticipated discount and cost that we can expect to get from our schools. And then that goes in line with where we're going to be desirable. And sometimes we can look at some of those further factors as well of what else may benefit us in terms of getting a scholarship and discount from a school, because really the intention is we just want to maximize getting as much scholarship and discount as we can. And there's kind of, and Corey probably could chime in a little bit more on this too, is we've always had this I use this example in the college planning, um, how to pay for college without going broke class about if you have two families, one of them has $100,000 in the bank and the other one has zero, who does the college feel like they need to give more money to in order to come, right? So sometimes when we think about that status quo, if this one family has more money than another, sometimes they, you know, you're, you look like you have an ability to pay more than somebody else, right? So that's just some of that logic in terms of college as a business. They don't have to give as much from their endowment to convince you to come because they don't think it's going to take as much to convince you to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and then the other side of this though, is that there is, this kind of goes deeper into understanding that the colleges are just trying to optimize financial aid. 
really that's it at the end of the day. And so they're just, this is a, I think the best example is just knowing that this is the financial package it's going to take to get this kid that I really want to come. And then can I afford that spend in order to be able to pull that off? Um, and I thought that this was, I'm going to put this in the chat box for you guys. You can read this later, but it's an article that I found on enrollment management that I think kind of explains that in a, in a good fashion, but you know, it motivates this process is used to get students to come, right? Which logically makes sense. If I'm going to give you more money, then I'm going to convince you that, you know, you're, it's all going to work out. Sometimes people are going to pay full price to go to that school that they want to go to. But this is really that world of stuff is understanding them as a business. <laughs> and all of this, I told you I wasn't going to talk for very long, leads into, <laughs> well, and just, I mean, Corey, do you have anything else in or years of playing this game that you want to throw in on kind of understanding that enrollment management piece and how it's going to tie into this, the rest of this funding side? Well, no, it's, it's a business. It, if you get a great award, great. If your student gets a, a not so great award, it's not a failure. Um, it's just business. And uh, then we get to move on to, okay, how are we going to pay this bill? And that's, you know, what Lance and I do going forward. So yes. you, you do all the hard work to push that price down as low as it is or can be. And then we just got to grab it and run with it and make it work. Exactly. So, and I think you probably, I mean, most of you probably saw in the email that I sent out is, you know, how you pay for college is 10 times more important than how much you pay for college. And everything that Lance is about to talk about tonight, me and Corey have both personally done. We have used these strategies. We have set these kinds of plans up for our families and making sure that colleges, I mean, Corey has two kids in college right now. Mine's only six. She's got a few years. So I'm more like figuring everything else out at the same time. But it's that reality of understanding that whatever the bill is, whether it's $25,000 a year, we're picking a school that's $50,000 a year, how are we going to fund and pay for it? And so, um, and Corey, like I said, I've been working with her for 12 years. She's been in the industry for much longer than that. And that has been her background and specialty as well as we've both been working in the admissions and the funding side of school of college. Um, and we're both part of the National College Advocacy Group. And so that's the nonprofit that kind of supports the foundation of a lot of what we do in supporting families and other advisors in this process. So <clears throat> Lance, though, is our super special guest who's going to talk more in depth on the how do we pay for college and get all of our money back in retirement. And he is super over the top with having five kiddos that he's got to put through college, right? So of course, he's going to care about all of this. Um, and he spent a year going through the Circle of Wealth program where he could teach all of the financial strategies around not just college funding, but retirement, tax, mortgage, debt, and all of that. So it's, he's very comprehensive in regards to his financial background and understanding of things, which is why I wanted him and Corey to join us tonight, because I think that this is super valuable information for everybody to understand how you can do this and not have to super stress. And so that is what I'm going to let Lance take over. I think I made you as a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Maybe if I stop sharing mine. All right, let me give that a shot. I will <laughs> share screen. Hold on, except for my little window disappeared. Where did it go? Hold on, there it is. Okay, share screen, got it. All right. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. All right. Perfect. And you can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. You want me to just dive in? Yes, please. 
All right. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here and thanks for inviting me. This is a lot of fun. I enjoy uh, being able to talk about this. And so thanks for having me on. I'm going to talk about the retirement scholarship strategy. It's just a name I made up when I wrote this book called the retirement scholarship strategy. You do not have to buy this book, however, because I'm going to tell you everything you need to know right now. So anyway, um, that is just a fun name that I came up with, which is how to send your child to any school of their choice and get all of your money back in retirement. And although everything you just talked about is 100% correct, we don't have to have scholarships or financial aid for this particular strategy to work. If you can get scholarships and financial aid, that's great. But if not, if you have one of those students that's gifted in other ways, then you can still use this particular strategy to help them pay for any school that they want. So this presentation, I'm going to talk about why you shouldn't use your college 529 accounts to save or pay for college, which might make people a little bit upset. You might not like that idea, but I'll explain why. Um, I'm also going to talk about why you shouldn't use your savings, your retirement, your whole life insurance, or even your monthly cash flow to pay for college. I'm also going to talk about maybe why you shouldn't use private college loans or home equity loans to pay for college. And instead, I'm going to show you how to use the retirement scholarship strategy for any school in the country and get literally all of your money back to be able to use in retirement. So this is going to work for all of you with younger students. So Crystal, when you're starting young, it works great, right? Um, and also those of you who have kids that are already in high school or already in college. If you're crazy like me, you have one of each. I've got it all the way from college all the way down to first grade. So um, it will work for anyone, no matter where you're at in that spectrum. Also, for those of you who have a lot of money already saved for college, then great, that's great. Um, this will work for you. Um, and also for those of you who don't have anything saved and you're still trying to figure out how in the world you're going to pay for college, it will work for you as well. And with virtually any budget. So if you're willing to help your kids with a hundred bucks a month, then you can use that towards this plan. If you are going to send your kids to top tier Ivy League schools and you've got a half a dozen kids, you might need to put in hundreds of thousands of dollars into a plan like this and it will work for you as well. So yes, Crystal's right. I do have five kids. And so I always tell everyone that I have learned all this information out of desperation more than inspiration because obviously I need to apply these strategies. And like I mentioned, I'm the author of the Retirement Scholarship Strategy book and the owner of a company company called Leggetti. Um, also, just recently, we have kind of teamed up with Kevin Harrington from the Shark Tank to be able to help more families learn about these unique ways of paying for college. In fact, we just recently met with Kevin and we shot a commercial that is going to be airing on national television um, actually next month. And, uh, and my wife, she took a picture or she took a video of this um, from the corner. So I just want to play one little small clip pay for their children's college without sacrificing their retirement i recommend these unique strategies to save and pay for your kids college education and joining me today is the owner lance morgan lance all right so anyway even kevin harrington recommends this strategy so hopefully you like it too um but one of my mentors uh don blanton he used to always say if what you thought to be true turned out not to be true when would you want to know? So I'm going to ask you if what you thought to be true about paying for college turned out not to be true, when would you want to know? And hopefully that's right now because I'm going to dive right into it. All right. This is going to require a new mindset. Everyone that takes this workshop that I do, they always say at the end that it takes a different way of thinking. It's a different way of looking at it. And so I'm going to encourage you all to be open minded um, and look at this as a new strategy that maybe you haven't heard of before. So like I said, the retirement scholarship strategy, strategy is how to send your kids to any school of their choice and get all of your money back without scholarships or financial aid. We always talk about four secrets to reduce the cost of college. Um, Crystal is great, and so is Corey, at helping you maximize that free money from the schools. You can also um, sometimes qualify for some loan discounts. And then this is what we call secret number three, which is how to get a full college funding refund. And like Crystal said earlier, how you pay for college is 10 times more important than how much you pay because it's such a big chunk of money that you could literally get back in retirement. 
So we're going to break this down into three sections, the concept, the details, and some case studies. So since we are on here live, you can ask any question that you want, and I will try to answer as many of them as I can. I usually take two hours to go through this information, so I have cut this way back, and I'm going to try to squeeze it into a very small period of time, and so then we'll just answer any questions that you have at the end. So let's dive into the concept. Here's the big secret. The big secret is that everyone finances college. Now, some of you might be saying, well, I don't finance college because I saved enough money so I can pay cash. Or maybe you are going to try to cash flow college so you don't have to take out any loans. However, you either pay interest on loans or you give up the interest that you could have earned by paying cash. So there's what we call the cost of college. It might cost you 25 grand a year, but then there's also the opportunity cost of paying for college. What could that 25,000 a year earn in retirement if you didn't pay it for college? So you're not just paying 25 grand a year for college, it's what that money could have earned. So that lost opportunity cost. So let me give you an example. So if we pull up some numbers here, just as an example, and let's say that you are earning 6%, and let's say that you have some savings, and now you're going to pay $30,000 a year with a little inflation in there. You got to love it. So we're going to pay $30,000 a year plus inflation for college. Now, you might think that that's just going to cost you that money out of your pocket. But if that money could have earned 6% interest, then you are going to lose all of this growth on the money, okay? So if you are 10 years later down the road on this scenario here at age 60, that money could have grown to $224,000, but it won't be $224,000 because you're gonna spend it on college. So if you take your 529 account or your savings or your retirement or your whole life insurance or whatever it is, and you spend it on college, it's no longer going to be compounding interest. So as you look, you know, 20 years down the road, that money could have been over $400,000. If you're looking at 30 years down the road, that money could have been almost three quarters of a million dollars that you're not going to have because you paid for college. So don't get me wrong, you know, yes, there are, you know, nobody likes to pay interest on loans, but don't kid yourself. If you pay cash for college, you're still financing it by giving up the interest that you could have earned. And that is kind of the, the concept, okay? Now, here's the question. What if you could borrow money for less than you could earn on your savings? And what if you weren't required to make loan payments on those loans? Now, Crystal, do we have the chat working? All right. So put in your chat box, which would you rather do if you were given the choice? Which would you rather do? Would you rather pay cash or if you could borrow for less than what you could earn on your money, what would you rather do? Would you rather borrow or would you rather pay cash? All right, Sarah says borrow, Vish says borrow. All right, Robert, borrow, 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 leverage. All right, perfect, excellent. We're all on the same page. Excellent, this is a great group. All right, now here, here is the, uh, here's kind of the kicker here. Have you ever heard of the option to be able to borrow without making loan payments? So if you were given the choice, if you had the choice every month you make a certain amount of money and most of it's going to go in your lifestyle. Or we could also put kids because they're stinking expensive, aren't they? All right. We could put, we could put kids right here. So you're going to spend all this money on your lifestyle and on your kids with what little bit you have left over. Would you rather, would you rather put that money towards compounding interest at six to 8% or would you rather put it towards a loan payment that was costing you five. Now, once again, if you had the choice, which would you rather do? Where would you rather put your money? Go ahead and put it in the chat box. Where would you rather put your money? 
All right. Everyone agrees compounding. Perfect. All right. I like it. I would agree. That is correct. So when you spend your money, it's like killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. Now, I don't have any geese laying golden eggs, but we do have about 50 chickens. And my little seven-year-old likes to take the eggs up to the road and he likes to sell them so that he can earn a little bit of side cash. All right. Now with the cost of eggs these days, it sure doesn't take very long for him to sell out. But if we killed all those chickens, right, then where in the world are we going to get eggs from? So if you spend your money, it's the same. So the old way of paying for college is to save and then spend, right? If you save your money and then you spend it on college, you are interrupting all of the compounding interest. So step one is to save and earn uninterrupted. That's the word of the day. Actually, it's three words, but those are the words of the day. Uninterrupted compounding interest for the rest of your life. I don't care if you have a senior in high school and they're going to school next year and you don't have any money saved. You could still start saving and let that money grow for the rest of your life. So even if you're 60 years old, you've got another 30 years, right? And then step two, here's the other word of the day. We are going to use our savings as collateral. That's the other word of the day. We're going to use our money as collateral to secure a loan at a lower rate with optional, now there's the other one, optional loan payments to pay for college or pay back college loans. Now, in just a second, I'm going to show you where you can earn six to 8% on your savings and where you can borrow money at 5% without making a loan payment. Now, the difference, even the difference between that 1% is going to literally give you the entire cost of college back during retirement. All right. So Meredith wants to know where we can earn 6 to 8%. We're going to show you in just a second. So um, let's just talk about the concept in one more, I want to show you one more visual because I'm kind of a visual person. So let's, I want to show you one more visual. So step one, step one is you're going to save your money. Now, instead of killing the goose that lays the golden eggs and spending that money, we're going to use that money as collateral and we're going to borrow the money. Okay. So instead of interrupting, the compounding interest, we're going to borrow at a lower interest rate and let that money continue to compound. Now, what if you have no money saved and you have college right around the corner? It's going to look like this. It's going to look like this. You're going to borrow the money from the college or not from the college, but from the government or from Discover Card or from Sally Mae, whoever you want, all right? Now, there's definitely a lot of pros and cons. You want to choose wisely on those loans, but you're going to borrow the money to pay for college. You might borrow for year one, then year two, then year three, then year four. So you might borrow the money to pay for college while you're simultaneously trying to save money while the kids are in school. Okay, so you're going to probably borrow a lot more than you can save, or you probably would have paid cash, which we don't recommend that, of course, but, but to, generally speaking, you're going to borrow a lot more than what you can save. But eventually, it's going to look a little something like this, and then you're going to take out these loans. So we've got two loans going on, right? We've got one loan to pay for college. We've got a second loan using our money as collateral to pay down these loans. And we're gonna keep saving, we're gonna keep borrowing, and we're gonna keep paying down those loans. We're gonna keep saving, we're gonna keep borrowing, and we're gonna keep paying down those loans. Does that make sense? That's kind of the concept, all right? Okay, I gotta remember which way to swipe on my computer here. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, <laughs> So that is the concept. Now, I know all of you are dying to know how this all works. So let's dive in to the specific companies and products that allows this to work. We need three non-negotiable components in order for this to work. Number one, 
uninterrupted compounding interest. Remember, those are the three words of the day, uninterrupted compounding interest. Then we need loans at a lower interest rate. And then we need optional loan payments. Now, the reason why that is so important is because you might be able to go out and get a home equity loan, but now you might have a $1,000 a month home equity loan. And so that $1,000 a month is not compounding interest. Now, remember a minute ago, you all agreed that you want that $1,000 a month going towards compounding interest, not going towards a loan payment, okay? So that's why we need all three of these in order for this strategy to work. Now, it would be really nice if we could get a nice competitive rate of return. We might not get 20% returns every year, but it would be nice to get maybe 6 to 8%, right? Which I'll show you how to do that. Um, we, want it, we don't want it to negatively affect our EFC number. That's basically what Crystal was just talking about. We want to position ourselves so that we don't look like we have tons of money saved for college so that we can maximize that financial aid. So we don't want to hurt our EFC number, okay? We want low fees. We want tax-free growth. We want tax-free access to the money. It wouldn't be bad if we could deduct the money as well. Um, we would like no stock market losses. Anyone brave enough to admit that they lost money recently? Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> All right. If you lost any money in the stock market recently, you may want to avoid that in a best case scenario, right? Um, how about guaranteed loan approval? Have you ever jumped through the hoops to get a loan before? I mean, how would you like to just instantly get approved? Um, how about fixed loan interest? Man, that would be a bad deal if all of a sudden my loan started shooting up when interest rates skyrocket and all of a sudden that loan goes through the roof. We can't be having any variable loans. Uh, that could create a major problem. Um, high contribution limits. Any of you a little behind on your college savings? <laughs> you know, you might need to catch up a little bit. All right. Flexible contributions, like during COVID, when you lose your job and you can't make a payment, you might need a little flexibility in those payments and you might need access to the money, okay? So you might think that access to the money should be up here in my non-negotiable components. But remember, you don't actually need access to the money. You need to use the money as collateral to borrow against it. But that doesn't mean that it's not a bad thing. If you can get access to the money, that's not a bad thing either. Okay, so let's start with our favorite 529 accounts. Our 529 accounts, they might earn a nice little 6 to 8% return, okay? But when it comes to paying for college, can we use our 529 accounts as collateral and borrow money from Charles Schwab where we have our 529 accounts? No, the 529 accounts have to be used for college or now they've got new rules where you can maybe put some into Roth IRAs and maybe you can pay back some of the loans with them. But as a general rule, you're going to have to spend that money. We can't use the money as collateral to borrow against it at a lower rate and it obviously not going to get any loan payments either. Now, does it grow tax-free? Sure, it grows tax-free. Um, could you get some low fees? Of course. Could you get a good rate of return? Yes. Is it going to hurt your EFC number? Yes. But if you make a lot of money, maybe that doesn't matter. But it's still something to consider. Um, you're going to get tax-free access to the money, but you're not going to be able to deduct the money going in. Um, anyone lose any money in their 529 accounts recently? Because that's common. That could happen. Um and then so on and so forth. You know, we got other some other options there. Okay, that that is the idea behind the five twenty nine account. The biggest problem is that you are interrupting the compounding interest. That's the biggest problem. Okay, like I said, you're killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. That is the old way, not the new way. The other problem is is just recently we lost a lot of money in the market. So anyone who had money in the market may have lost money in their five twenty nine accounts. And if you lost money in your 529 accounts when you needed to use the money, so if you have kids in college and you're taking money out when the market is down, 
that's kind of adding insult to injury. So not, not a bad thing or not a good thing. Okay. How about savings? Have you ever met a bank that will give you a better rate of return on your savings account than what they're going to charge you for loans? No, it doesn't work. There's not a bank that will do that. Okay. How about a 401k loan? When you take out a 401k loan, you are interrupting the compounding interest of your money. It's not like your employer is giving you a loan. They're just giving you access to your 401k without penalties. So you are interrupting the compounding interest and you're required to make a loan payment on those 401k loans. How about using your brokerage account and taking out what they call a margin loan? Well, yes, you could allow your stocks to continue to compound interest. And yes, you could borrow money at a lower rate, but be really careful because a lot of times the brokerage firms are charging you pretty high variable rate loans, um, but they also require a loan payment. These brokerage firms are going to re require a loan payment. However, you could, you could buy some Amazon stock and instead of selling your Amazon stock, you could use your Amazon stock as collateral and you could take out what we call a margin loan. The only problem with that is that when the market drops, you're losing your collateral, right? You're losing your collateral when the market drops. So they may require you to sell your stocks to cover the loan. And that creates a problem as well, depending on the market conditions. All right. How about real estate? How many of you would love to have a mortgage without a loan payment? How cool is that? We could have our house and our house could be growing in value and we could take out a loan without a loan payment. And that loan would just kind of cruise along. And someday when we sell our house, we pay off the mortgage. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right. They call that a reverse mortgage. And I don't know if any of us are old enough for that one. So other than that, other than that, you are not going to be able to get a home equity line of credit, a second mortgage, a first mortgage that has an optional loan payment. That's the problem. We're not going to get optional loan payments on real estate. How about whole life insurance? If you've been on any other college webinars, a lot of people like to use whole life insurance to shelter some money from that EFC calculation. Now that's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day, but the money inside of whole life insurance could you know, be sheltered from the EFC calculation. And ironically, you could have loans with optional loan payments, depending on the company. Every company is different, but you could have optional loan payments and you could get an uninterrupted compounding interest, but you're not going to get loans at a lower rate because a whole life company operates more like a bank. So you might be earning four to 5% on a whole life policy and your loans could be as high as six to 8%. So if your life insurance is growing like this and your loans are growing like this, that creates a problem, okay? Now, the other problem with life insurance is that generally speaking, it is very, very, very expensive because of the cost of the insurance. And so because of the cost of the insurance, it makes it really expensive. Now, the new kid on the block, the new kid on the block is called the Index Universal Life Insurance, or also known as the IUL. Now, the IUL is a permanent type of life insurance. Let me go over here to my visual, okay? It's a permanent type of life insurance, which is kind of like an insurance company savings account inside of life insurance. So if you've never you know, used permanent life insurance, it's different than term insurance. So term insurance, you only have insurance. That's it. It's, period. it's just life insurance. But whole life insurance, and index universal life insurance has this savings component, okay? There's the savings component and there's the insurance component. So you have like an insurance company savings account 
and you have the life insurance and you can use that as collateral and you can borrow money from the insurance company, okay, potentially at a lower rate. So in this particular example, you could earn six to 8%. You could borrow money at 5% and you could get optional loan payments. You could also get um, a competitive return. It's not going to hurt your EFC number. It's going to grow tax-free, just like a Roth IRA or a 529 account. You can get free uh, tax-free access to the money, just like a Roth IRA or a 529 account. Um, you cannot deduct the money, just like a 529 account or a Roth IRA. However, with a 529 account, some states do allow for like a state deduction on the state taxes, depending on the state. Um, no stock market losses. Anyone like the idea of no stock market losses? All right, that's cool. Guaranteed loan options, no loan approval, no credit check or anything like that. Fixed loans, you could get a fixed 5%, high contribution limits, flexible contributions, and access to money. What's the only problem? What's the only problem? The only problem is very expensive. Generally speaking, very expensive. So I'm going to show you why this generally doesn't work. The reason why this generally doesn't work is because if you compare the fees to all of these other options at like a 1% fee, look at the fees compared to these other options at 1%. Okay. The fees are extremely high in this particular plan. However, however, high fees equals high commissions. So I'm going to teach you a secret of the wealthy. Okay. And how the billionaires, the banks, and the large corporations are using the life insurance like this IUL differently than what most people have heard of. For example, the banks are using it as what they call bank-owned life insurance, which is different than traditional life insurance because it's got high cash value and low insurance. That's the secret. That's the big secret. High cash value. So in other words, you want lots of savings. Let me go over here to my visual. You want lots of savings and just a little bit of insurance, okay? Just a little bit of insurance and lots of cash value, okay? And then the cost is low compared to other insurance products. The cost is low. Now, Tony Robbins, in this huge book on money, master the game, in chapter five, he talks about what they call secrets of the ultra wealthy that you can use too. And they, they talk about all the tax advantages and, and everything else, right? Now, in this book, he talks about how it's not the billionaires who are buying the most life insurance, but the biggest buyers are the banks and the large corporations like Walmart and Wells Fargo to the tune of $18 billion back in 2014 in cash value, okay? So it can be done correctly and it is possible to keep the fees low by having low insurance and high cash value. In other words, Low insurance and lots of savings, like, like this insurance company savings account. And that is what's going to give you the low fees. The only problem is, is low fees equals what? Low fees, low fees equals low commissions. And so that's why you've probably never heard of this before. But check this out. The life insurance, if done correctly, could be that much less than all these other options at a 1% fee. So in other words, the life insurance could be less than 1% in fees after a while. You know, it takes a little bit of time over, because in the beginning, it is a little bit more expensive in the beginning, okay? But over time, it can be a lot less. Now, why isn't everyone doing this? 
And why hasn't your financial advisor or your insurance agent told you about it? Because it really doesn't pay a whole lot of commissions, just to be honest with you. You know, it doesn't pay as much because insurance agents only get paid on the insurance part. So if you keep the insurance to a minimum, then it doesn't pay as much in commissions, okay? So if done correctly, if done correctly, now you can get everything you need except for tax deductible contributions. But everything else you can get in an IUL if done correctly, okay? All right, now, Caution, okay? Caution, not all life insurance earns six to 8% on average, okay? Not all insurance plans, not, in, not all insurance products, not, uh, not all IULs, not all insurance companies are going to have a product that earns six to 8%, okay? Um, not all insurance companies are going to offer you 5% fixed loans, okay? Not all insurance companies are going to offer 5% fixed loans. And your financial advisor will probably tell you not to do it because most financial advisors, like myself, I had about eight or nine years of experience in the financial industry before I learned about this. I, I was guilty. I used to sell a lot of 529 accounts. I used to sell a lot of traditional financial strategies because I worked for a brokerage firm and brokerage firms want the money in the stock market because that's how the brokerage firms gets paid. That's how we got paid. We got paid on what we call assets under management. So the more money we had in the stock market, the more money we made on assets under management. So most of your financial advisors are not going to want you putting your money in life insurance. And insurance agents are going to try to sell you too much life insurance because too much life insurance is going to cost you a lot of fees, but it's going to pay them a lot of commissions, okay? So I'm going to show you the right way versus the wrong way to do this. First of all, here is the wrong way to do it. Let's go over here to the wrong way. Now, my wife says I'm not very good at multitasking, but I am glancing at some of your comments and I promise I will get to those questions. Um, so hang tight for those. Just go ahead and keep asking your questions and I, I promise I will get to them. So here is what not to do. Now, um, Corey and Crystal, somebody did make a comment about not being able to see my screen. Hopefully that's just a one, a one scenario there. Can everybody else see it? I messaged him, okay. so hopefully... Okay. Okay, hopefully he can get on there. If you're watching it on a phone, sometimes it's a little hard on the phone if you switch off to try to look at the comments or something. Um, but anyway, okay, so in this example, they are buying $290,000 of life insurance and they're paying $10,000 a year for that $290,000. Now, part of that $10,000 is going towards the insurance company savings account. So this is that cash value that I talked about. This is the savings that you could use to pay for college, basically, right? But look at these fees. We're talking about like, what is that? 36% in fees? We're talking about really high fees. And what happens when you get older with life insurance? Anyone know? Go ahead and put it in the chat box. What happens when you get older to your fees? See this column right here? All right. Um, I lost the chat, but anyway, I'm guessing. Did somebody respond? Let's see here. Uh, gets more expensive. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I found it. All right. So as you get older, the expenses go so high that it actually reduces your cash value. Okay. Now, the insurance company could collect over $460,000 in expenses. That's a lot. That's a lot of expenses. This is what not to do. Now, let me show you how you could do this correctly. First of all, you don't have to buy that much life insurance. The government will let you get away 
with about $125,000 in life insurance for a 50-year-old that wants to put in $10,000 a year. Now, the government does control this a little bit. So if you are older, you don't have to buy as much life insurance. If you are younger and you want to put this on your kids, it doesn't make as much sense as you think because the government would require you to buy a ton of life insurance on the kids to be able to put in this kind of money. So you can, you can put it on the kids, but it usually makes more sense to put it on the parents. Okay. But for, I, I saw a comment in there that said, what if you're too old to buy life insurance? You're not too old to buy life insurance. I mean, I've sold this to people in their seventies and their eighties, as long as you're healthy enough to get the life insurance. We're not really worried about the life insurance. We're trying to build up the cash value. It's not about the life insurance. Um, somebody also asked, what if you can't get the life insurance? Well, once again, hopefully you're healthy enough to at least get it. We don't really care what your rating is. We just need you to be able to get it. But if you have a spouse that could get it, if you can't get it, or worst case scenario, we could put it on the kids. And honestly, it's not a bad deal to put some on the kids anyway, to kind of give them a plan for when they get older. So there's always usually somebody that you could find to put the insurance on. Okay, now here's the magic. Here's what the banks, the large corporations and all the billionaires are doing. You see this? They are reducing the insurance. So not only are they starting with less insurance, but they're reducing the insurance over time. Now, we're gonna show you how to meet with us one-on-one -on -one to go into all these details on your own specific plan because there's no way I'm gonna be cover covering all these details in this much time. But the key is, is that you're reducing the insurance. So guess what happens to your expenses when you reduce the insurance? The expenses go down. Now, look at when we get older. If we keep the insurance in check, and we keep the insurance to a minimum, guess what happens to our expenses? They stay to a minimum. Way less than 1%. Way less than 1% over time. Okay? Now, what do you think the insurance company and the insurance agents are going to want? $65,000 in expenses or $467,000 in expenses? Does that make sense why most people have never heard about this? Okay. Most people have never heard about this because it's not really in the benefit of the insurance company to do this, and it doesn't benefit the insurance agent to do this. But let me show you an example of how this would work for somebody that has young kids, and then I'm going to show you how this would work if you have a senior in high school. All right. So if you have young kids, you could put in $100,000 a year for 10 years, and then you could borrow $100,000. Now, I know that college is gonna cost more than $25,000 a year in 11 years from now, but I wanted these numbers to be really round and even so I could do math in my head, okay? And maybe college is gonna be 50 grand a year, but you're willing to help your kids with half of it. That would be another example. But my point is, is that we are putting in $10,000 a year for 10 years into this plan. And then we are borrowing $25,000 a year from the insurance company using our money as collateral. So check that out. Does it interrupt the compounding interest? Nope. No, it does not interrupt the compounding interest. It is just like taking out a home equity loan using your money as collateral, okay? So it does not interrupt any of the compounding. However, if you don't make any loan payments, what happens to the loan balance? The loan balance is gonna go up. But as long as it goes up at a slower rate, then your money is growing, which by the way, I am showing 6% interest, 6% interest, and 5% loan interest. I'm just showing you a 1% positive gain. And with that 1% positive gain, you could eventually 
have a full refund on the cost of college. You could get all of your money back during retirement to use for whatever you want. Now, let's say that your kid decides not to go to college. You could use this for anything. Let's say that your student wants to go overseas to college. It'll work for that. Let's say that your student wants to go to a trade school. It'll work for that. It'll work for anything you want. Let's say that you wanna buy a boat. It'll work for that, <laughs> okay? It'll work for anything you want, anything you want. Okay, now I'm gonna show you another example. Let's say that you have a senior in high school and no money saved for college. If you have a senior in high school and no money saved for college, we want to borrow the money. Remember, if we have a senior in high school, we're gonna take out these college loans. And then we're going to start putting money in to this life insurance plan so that we could eventually pay back those college loans. So in this example, I am estimating that my future college loan payment is gonna be $19,000 a year for 10 years. That's for a senior in high school. Now, remember, we don't have to make loan payments until six months after graduation, okay? So for four years while they're in college, we're going to pay for college using college loans. Then we're going to take out life insurance loans to pay back the college loans. So in other words, we're going to basically just get a head start. We're going to get a head start on the college loan payments is really what we're doing. So we're putting $190,000 into the plan and then we're borrowing $194,000 from the plan to pay back the college loan payments. Does that make sense? Now, once again, with a 1% positive gain, we have all of this money to use in retirement. Now, for all of you Dave Ramsey fans, don't worry because guess what? You're not in debt. You're not in debt because I can pay off these loans anytime I want with my money. I can take the money out of my account and pay off those loans anytime I want. So I'm never in debt. How many of you would like to learn how to pay off your mortgage in less than 30 seconds? I can tell you in less than 30 seconds. You wanna know how to pay off your mortgage? Anyone? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, all right. Sell your house, <laughs> all right? If you sell your house, you can pay off your mortgage. Now, you might live in a van down by the river with Chris Farley, rest his soul, but <laughs> But your, your mortgage would be paid off, right? Your mortgage would be paid off because your house is being used as collateral for that mortgage payment. Does that make sense? For that mortgage. That mortgage is really not debt because you could pay off that mortgage anytime you want by just selling your house. You want to get rid of your car payment? Sell your car. Ride a bike. <laughs> All right, so we're using our money as collateral so that we could pay off those loans anytime we want. All right, um, I know we're out of time, so I'm going to open it up to questions, but I do want to go over here and I want to pull up um, a couple things real quick. Where in the world take, can you take get- Take your time, this is important. Uh, all right, well, so where, where in the world are we going to get 6 to 8%? This is just a screenshot from one of the companies that we work with. We are completely independent. We represent over 56 different insurance companies. We will help you find the best insurance plan for your situation, okay? And this particular company, the average has been around that 7% range. And so I am quoting 6%. So I showed you numbers using 6% returns and 5% loans, just a 1% positive gain. That's it. But there's a good chance that you could get a lot more than a 1% positive gain. And if you get more than a 1% positive gain, then life is good. Also, this particular product is guaranteed to never lose any money 
when the stock market drops. Now, if you want to know how the insurance companies are doing that, we can talk about that later. Um, I don't want to you know, bore you with too many details, but these particular plans can earn 7% on average without any stock market losses. Now, if the US files bankruptcy and it's going to make the Great Depression look like a trip to Disneyland, you know, then maybe we move our money into a fixed account where we get fixed returns. And that's another option inside this plan if we want. Now, we don't want to do that unless we have to because we can't be borrowing money at 5% if we're only earning 4%. Obviously, that's more like a whole life plan. That would not work, okay? Um, and then um, I want to show you real quick. Oh, some pros and cons. OK, no college funding plan is perfect. So I want to show you some uh, pros and cons here. Number one. Well, first of all, here's all the benefits. We went through the benefits. You can take a screenshot of this if you want. Take a picture with your phone, whatever. Um, we know what all the benefits are. Let's talk about the five considerations. Number one, it requires more discipline and consistency because you're buying an insurance product. So you need to put money in consistently. That doesn't mean you have to put in the numbers that we're talking about. If you can't afford to do 10,000 one year, you could only do 5,000 if you want. There is some flexibility in the payments, but you do need to be more consistent than putting in your birthday money into a 529 account every year. You need to be a little bit more consistent than that. Um, limited access in the early years. So they do not give you access. Let me go back over here. Okay. They do not give you access to all of your money until after the 12th year. That doesn't mean you have to wait 12 years to access the money. You just can't access all of the money until after the 12 years. So this is not going to work to pay for college next semester. That's why we need the college loans. We need the college loans to pay for college while we let this build up a little bit. OK, so we have to use the college loans in order for this to work. If you have kids already in high school. It is life insurance. You must qualify. So, yes, that is, you know, that is a kicker. If you've been recently diagnosed with cancer or something, that could be an issue, which, you know, my heart goes out to you, of course, if that's the case. Hopefully not. But, you know, but that is a consideration. Um, also. The U.S. might file bankruptcy and you might not earn six to eight percent anymore in the future. I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I can guarantee you won't lose any money. And if you don't lose any money, then you can just use your money to pay off the loans because we don't want these loans to go up at five percent if we're not if we're not earning any more money. So we would take our money and we would pay off those loans in a worst case scenario. That's the worst thing that could happen. OK. All right. And last but not least, it requires a different mindset. Recently, there was this article that talked about all these billionaires that weren't paying their fair share in taxes. And it made everybody upset because, you know, Warren Buffett's only paying 0.10% in taxes, Jeff Bezos 0.9%, Michael Bloomberg 1.3%, and Elon Musk at 3.7%. So everybody was upset that they weren't paying their, paying their fair share in taxes. But what I thought was very interesting about this article is how, how are they doing it? Well, their, their wealth derives from the skyrocketing value of their assets. That's another way of saying uninterrupted compounding interest, okay? Those gains are not defined by the U.S. tax laws as taxable income unless and until the billionaire sells. So if old Jeff Bezos, if his stock, his Amazon stock is cruising along at, let's say, 10% on average, and he wants to go buy himself a vacation home, and that vacation home is going to cost him a million dollars, is he going to sell some of his Amazon stock to buy that house? Or do you think he might take out a mortgage at 3 to 4%? What do you think he's going to do? Now, I don't know Jeff Bezos personally. But anyone want to take a guess? What would you guess? Do you think he would sell his stock so he has to pay taxes on it? And so he interrupts the compounding interest? Or do you think he would take out a loan? Now, a lot of people think that billionaires pay cash for everything. 
but that's not true. Okay, like it says in this article, how did the mega billionaires pay their mega bills while opting for dollar salaries and hanging on to their stock? Well, according to the public documents and experts, the answer for some is borrowing money. Lots of it. It's not bad to borrow money if you can borrow money at a lower rate than what you can earn on your savings. And that is the story. Okay. Um, let's go here. Okay. Last question. Here's my last question. Would you jump out of an airplane without a parachute for a hundred thousand dollars? Anyone put it in the chat box. Would you jump out of an airplane without a parachute for a hundred thousand dollars? What do you think? I mean, a hundred thousand dollars could go a long ways towards college, a long ways towards college. Anyone, anyone. All right. Anyone. What if, what if the airplane was on the ground? Okay. And you have these nice little bouncy things to jump on. All right. That changes everything, doesn't it? So I had to give you a two hour presentation in a lot less than two hours. So I'm sure you have a ton of questions. That is why we are offering some free quotes to show you how to do this. Um, no strings attached. Um, this is a gift from Crystal to all of you that are on her team. So we will show you exactly how to use this plan and exactly how this would work for your scenario. We'll run your own numbers. We'll figure out what the college cost will be. We'll figure out what the college loan cost will be. We can figure out all the kids in your family and we'll show you how to build a plan that will work for your situation. And I'm sure you're gonna have a lot of questions. Of course, you're gonna have a lot of questions, but don't lose out on a $100,000 opportunity by not having all the facts, right? Get, get all the facts first. Don't go jump on Google and talk to your financial advisor. They're gonna tell you not to do it because most of the time it's done incorrectly. Most of the time it's done with really high fees and it's not going to work, but it can work. That's why the billionaires are doing it. That's why the banks are doing it. That's why all the large corporations are doing it. You can get it to work correctly if you know how to do it. And we will show you how to do it correctly. So book an appointment and we'll run some numbers for you. All right, that's it. Questions? I want to just say thank you to Lance and Corey for being on tonight. And yeah, he did go through a lot in a very short period of time. And so, and as you guys know too, right? Cause we've been talking about all of the college planning stuff forever. There's always a lot to absorb in this whole world of everything. Um, and I do want to also just remind everybody too, that we will be, uh, these are concierge calls, right? These are, we do one of these every month. And Lance mm -hmm. was the one that was here with us tonight. Um, and like I said, Corey's been working with me forever. We both have these kinds of plans set up for ourselves. We wouldn't be in telling you about this if we didn't believe and know that it worked. Okay. And so by all means, you are welcome to meet with Corey. Lance is, uh, always supporting her in regards to everything for, um, all of this as well. Right. So we're all here as a team to be able to work with this, um, process with you. And our next, um, this is recorded, right? So I am going to um, get it up to uh, to the world of YouTube and then be able to share this with you guys. So for the clients that'll be in your files in College Planner Pro, I will share it within all of our Facebook groups as well for my clients, as well as those in the community so that you guys have access to this. And I'll put Corey's link in there as well. So if you guys come back to this and you need to schedule and you realize, yeah, I really just need to watch this again. <laughs> By all means, you can. Um, and our next session too will be in March. Um, it's March 7th at 5 p.m. And we're going to be talking about everything you need to know about letters of recommendation for college applications, right? So that's for my 2024 concierge clients. Um, that is what we're going to be working on. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and I guess I'll put this in here too, as well, because I, I know that this went, I'm going to send, I'm going to send out some emails through college, um, through constant contact. So everybody should be on the lookout for those that'll also have a link to the recording. Um, but 
for those of you that aren't in just our general college planning Facebook community, that's where it's going to hit first um, in terms of the recording. So I've put that in there for you as well. Um, so if for whatever reason you have found us today from I don't know where, you are welcome to join us there and get the posting in that. Um, and I see, I think there was a question in here. Um, I think this would be more of a Lance question that Shelly has. Um, is that the last one? Oh, yes. Um, or Steve, well, let's see here. I thought I saw one in here. Oh, yes, Shelly. So, yes, Shelly. Um, if you are over 60, not a problem. You just don't buy, you, you're not required by the IRS to buy as much life insurance. So, the younger you are, the more insurance you get for your money. But the insurance is kind of the secondary benefit of this. We're trying to maximize that cash value. So it doesn't matter if you're in your 60s or whether you're in your 30s, that will just change the amount of insurance. But it doesn't really change much in the fees and it doesn't really change much in the actual cash value. So it still works great. It doesn't matter how old you are. You can still make it very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, Steve says, when the student completes college, what percentage of the insurance savings is available for paying down the student loans? Totally depends on how much you can afford to save for the four years that they're in school. The more you and, can save. And how right? much time we have before we have to start paying loans. Correct. Yep. And there's ways to postpone loans too. There's um, all sorts of different loan strategies that we could talk about too. Um, but yeah, so usually if you have a senior in high school, you know, you've got four years at least. While they're in school, if they go into grad school or something, then you've got even longer. Uh, and then this link on here, if you were looking at scheduling an appointment, this is the link. So this yeah. you can take you can take a picture of the screen here. And I put and, it in the chat box too, so and, you guys have it that way. Yeah, Crystal's got it in the chat. You can do that too. Um, so let's say that you have health issues. Um, will it be able to get this insurance because the life insurance isn't as much as savings? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it doesn't matter the amount of insurance. As long as you can qualify for the insurance, you could get it. It depends on your health issues, but you'd be surprised. A lot of people with health issues can still get approved. Um, they just might, you might not get like the super preferred rating, but that doesn't really matter for what we're doing. Um, <laughs> thank you for the permission. Okay. I think the health issues, I jumped on board, took months to assume my fears and how you well, I am, believe it now. <laughs> All right, Brock says, thank you, Lance Scott. Glad I jumped on board. Took months to, uh, um, uh, to assume my fears associated with the IUL. I'm a believer now. Sorry, I'm not sure what that word is. I don't know. Maybe that was a typo or maybe I'm just- Wage, uh, yeah. yeah. So put aside my fears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, all right, looks like the calculator is logging in. Is that? Um, there should not be a link to the calculator. You should just be able to, or I mean, oh, to the calculator. Um, yeah, if you want to use the calculator to calculate your college loan payments, you can create a free account. It's free. So just create a free account. The reason why you have to create an account is because it saves it. So if you want to log back in later, you can log back in later. So that's just why it asks for an account. Um. Yeah, if you don't create an account on your own, that's what we'll do when we get together. Yeah, so yeah, we can help you create an account too. Just book an appointment. We can help you create the calculator numbers as well. Yep. All right. Um, if the student attends grad school, we are payments on college loans postponed. Yes, you can postpone payments until after grad school. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Any other questions that you guys have, feel free to reach out to us and we are happy to get in touch. And like I said, it'll I'll be getting stuff out in a lot of different ways. Oh, yeah, that was one question that did come oh, before. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up again, Sarah. Yeah. Um, it is life insurance. So if the policyholder passes, there is a tax-free death benefit paid out. Um, as far as the loans go, depending on what type of loans we're using, a lot of those, if we're using college loans, those come with a death and disability waiver. Um, 
So, you know, God forbid something happens to a parent, but the loans could be forgiven and the tax-free death benefit paid out. Thanks. I think what I'm, I was trying to figure out is, you know, with a numbers game and compounding interest over time is where you make the more money, if I'm understanding correctly. And I'm just wondering if, if death came sooner, is there at any point where this, this doesn't work out, the numbers not work out? I think that's what I was trying to understand. So, so I, ironically, it always ends up seeming like the death benefit is more than enough to cover the cost of college. So I always like this as a backup plan. What I usually tell people is put the life insurance on the primary breadwinner and then put the college loans on the other spouse. So then if the other spouse dies, those college loans are forgiven upon death, depending on the loans you get. And then if you put the life insurance on the primary breadwinner, if that person dies, then the life insurance pays out. I like it. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Steve asked a question too. I realize that some of you that are on this call are not my clients. Um, and so everything else that we were talking about, if, you know, in, and understanding picking schools and understanding scholarships and, and that world of stuff, um, I put my link in there. If you have questions on that side of things on the college planning piece, then you would want to schedule using that link so we could talk about that piece. What Corey and Lance are doing is focus on the, the financial of everything else, like you said. And Shelly, to answer your question, if if one parent isn't healthy, then we can always put on the other parent. And then if we have two parents with health issues, like Lance said, and we have to put it on the kids, there, there's workarounds. We've been through every scenario to make to make it work. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. And divorce too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I feel like sometimes part of the job is is actually therapist. So <laughs> life is complicated. Families are dynamic. That's, yeah. That's mm -hmm. it. yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys so much for spending your evening with us and um feel free to reach out. Like I said, you've got our links and um, I'll get that email and, and everything uploaded. And so I hope everybody has a great rest of their night. Super. Thank you. Thanks.